I was told, very small window for the sermon this morning, so I need to pray and get right into it. As we have this privilege of gazing into your word, I know that in the context of my own intellect, I always so desperately need your spirit to illuminate your truth to my heart, and I pray it would be illuminated to the hearts and minds of every individual in this room, that we would realize that these words are not something that were written thousands of years ago, but Father, there is, it's a living word that you use to speak to us in our relationship with you and the mission that you have called us into. For I pray these things in Christ's name, amen. For the last 30 plus years, I have participated in what some would call the ministry of mobilization. It would probably be better to give it the title of the ministry of irritation. I think uh, that is my spiritual gift to irritate people as it relates to the call of God in each person's life. And this sermon is entitled, This Idea of the Calling of God. Now, I live in a world where I have the privilege of speaking, whether it's in the United States or different parts of the world, communicating this idea of calling. But when most people hear, hear the word calling, they naturally gravitate to this definition. Excuse me, this is driving me nuts. Okay, first of all, I only wear a coat and tie when I preach in Chinese churches, so this is the first Anglo congregation that I've <laughs> worn a coat and tie with. I'm trying to get loosened up here. But normally when people hear the word calling, they think it from a very uh, narrow perspective, if you will. They think of people like Steve, those that stand on a platform, those that are called into missions around the world. So we hear the word calling a lot of times as though it is a special anomaly as it relates to the Christian faith that there are particular people called into vocational service. They get paid for what they do. Then there's the rest of us. And when we make that unfortunate definition, when we land on that definition, we begin to subconsciously think that we can live a life different from those who are called. They're paid to be good. They're paid to live a certain way. They're paid to bear witness of Christ. They're paid, they're paid to serve people within the community and to the ends of the earth. But I would argue that is a faulty perspective of calling. The text that was read just moments ago, is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, started with verse 14, goes through verse 21 at the end of the chapter. What I want to do is kind of unpack that for us in just some brief moments, highlighting some concepts. So if you want to go ahead and keep your Bible open, I will be making notations to different verses as it relates to that. The first thing I want you to realize is something that is paramount for us to realize in the context of the Christian life. I don't know about you, but there are so many times in my Christian life where I think I have to produce the motivation in my life to do things for Jesus. You know, the church gives you an opportunity to serve within the community, to maybe serve in other parts of the world, and we sit there going, I'm just not feeling it. Okay, Father, if I'm supposed to go, you're going to communicate that to me, and, and, and I'll try to work up the desire to do that. But notice verse 14, this wonderful phrase, for the love of Christ compels us. Other translations say the love of Christ controls us. Another translation would be the love of Christ motivates us. Everything in the Christian life is done not through your trying to create the desire. It is always that which is created by Christ who is within you. So our responsibility is not to create the desire. Our, des our responsibility is not to create the want to. 
our responsibility is to pursue the intimate knowledge of Christ every day of our lives as we engage his word and ask Christ by faith to cre create that impetus, that desire, which compels us to participate in his mission from Redlands to the ends of the earth. Two other things that I want you to notice in the context of this portion of scripture is there are two things that Paul focuses on that relates to what his death, burial, resurrection accomplished within our lives. The first one is verse 14. For he died that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake was raised, died and was raised. Do you notice this phenomenal benefit of salvation? We have been liberated from the slavery of living for self. That's probably not one of those benefits that you listed as one of the wonderful things that it was accomplished through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We think of salvation. We think of escaping hell. We think of the relationship that we can have with Christ. And to be quite honest, so many years in my life, I've seen Jesus as one who empowered me to accomplish my dreams and ambitions. Instead of realizing that one of the great works of Christ was to liberate me from the slavery of self so that I would live for him. And that becomes my motivation, that becomes my desire. It's that which doesn't just relate to service in the name of Jesus, but it also needs to relate to, do I love my wife because Christ is my motivation, and that Christ has liberated from the slavery of living for self in the context of marriage, in the context of the worst workplace, in the context of living in a neighborhood that God has blessed you with, in the context of living in a community that you're a part of, in the context of the world and his desire to reconcile the world to himself. The second amazing benefit that Paul speaks of in the context of the cross of Jesus Christ is verse 17. Therefore, and I'm quoting from English Standard and you're doing uh, NIV. No, yes, NIV. So you'll kind of see it, a little shift here. But the English Standard Version says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. See, I am no longer the same Jeff Lewis I was before I committed my life to Christ. Before I committed my life to Christ, I was unrighteous, I was a sinner, I was self-centered, and I could give you a litany of descriptions that would relate to who I was. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. But in Christ, I am now made alive. Now, this might be hard to believe, but this is what the scripture says about you now. You're a saint. You are righteous. You are holy. You are a child of God. You're the child of the king. We could go on and on and on. You might not feel differently, but we're not called to walk by feeling. We're called to walk by faith. The word of God says, you're a new creation. Jesus didn't come to save us from something. He came to create us in to what he always desired us to be. Paul puts it beautifully in Romans 28, I mean, Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. We are continually being conformed to the image of Christ as we walk in the fullness of Christ in the context of our lives. Now, those are great, fantastic realities as it relates to who we are in Jesus Christ. We've been liberated from the slavery of living for self, and we are a new creation. For at least 
15 years in my Christian walk with Christ, I thought all those blessings were really all about me. And I didn't understand the context of what Paul is talking about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's the context. It's our calling. Why have been, we been liberated from the slavery of living for self? Why are we new creations in Jesus Christ? Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. That's who we are. We're his ambassadors. We are his representatives. We don't represent self. We represent him. This is a phenomenal understanding. If we, this is our calling. This is who we are. This is what God has created us to be in him. Ambassadors for Christ, representing him. Just like any political or government ambassador that is scattered around the nations to represent his country. Not to represent his own interest or her own interest, but to represent the purpose and interest of their living God and King. And every day of our lives is to be lived strategically, intentionally in the context of that calling. I hope you paid attention to one of the words of witness that you stated at the beginning of the service. You claim that Jesus Christ was our Lord and Savior. That Lord and Savior has called you to be his ambassador. And then Paul goes into more detail. He says this ambassador has been given a ministry of reconciliation. That's verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself. So he reconciled, brought us into that reconciliation. We were separated from God. We were dead in our sin. We didn't have any hope without any of that. He brought us into that relationship, but it's not enough for us to just be fat and sassy in the context of what God has done in our lives. He has called us into that so that we would then participate in the ministry of reconciliation in the world in which he has sent us into. That ministry of reconciliation is just not proclaiming the truth of God and how men and women can be reconciled to God because they are separated from him because of sin. Separated from him because of rebellion. And how they can come into the intimacy of the living God through his son Jesus Christ. He is the one that reconciled us to the Father. But it's not just that kind of reconciliation. Paul talks about a reconciliation that breaks down the, down the walls of separation. We find that in Ephesians chapter 2. When Paul is declaring to the church that is not to be just a homogeneous representation of people that look like each other, act like each other, believe all the different ideological concepts of life together, and we come together in faith. No, the church is to be that heterogeneous community of people from different ideas, different ethnic backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, different political uh, opinions, and that what Jesus does is he breaks down the wall of separation of all those things so that we might find our reconciliation with each other. That's why a Baptist can stand up in a congregational church, because the wall of separation has been torn down, right? Amen? But it's even much more than that. It's with a neighbor that you might not be in very good terms with, or a coworker, or someone like that. He's come giving us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, that ministry of reconciliation, according to Paul, in the context of this section of Scripture, is a at least through the two avenues of proclamation. See, biblical proclamation is not just verbal. Biblical proclamation is also visual. So the proclamation 
in the ministry as ambassadors of Christ, being given the ministry of reconciliation, is accomplished through biblical proclamation, and biblical proclamation is both verbal and visual. Notice verse 19. That in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself and entrusted to us, the body of Christ, not just Steve, the body of Christ, entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. See, that's the verbal understanding. I'm always about ready to fall off. Good thing you had the tables here, or I would be walking the aisles. I mean, a good Baptist walks the aisles, right? Am I in? Can I hear it? Uh, No, I'm sorry. I've got to remember where I am. So, but it is that message your reconciliation that we begin that's the verbal how we came to come into that relationship with God how someone else can come into that relationship with God it's that beautiful message of Christ it's the gospel that we've been entrusted with but notice he doesn't just say that we have been entrusted with a message of reconciliation notice verse 21 we might miss this one He says, for our sake, God made Christ to become sin who knew no sin, that in him we might be the very righteousness of God. That's the visual expression of our redemption. See, that whole, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, Verse 21 is saying, men and women of God now allow the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God, which he has now created you in, to be made manifest, to be revealed in the way you interact with the world. Those are the two basic forms of proclamation, verbal and visual. You extract the visual from the verbal expression, then you're just a clanging symbol as you try to proclaim his gospel because it does not have the foundation of the righteousness of Christ that lives within you. But if you extract the visual proclamation from the verbal proclamation, you just look good and no one knows why. No one, they just might think, you know, they just might be a better character than me, and I could never live that good. See, you don't give them any hope just revealing the character. They have to have the verbal expression. Men and women of Jesus Christ, I would argue all day throughout the scriptures that we have a specific calling of God. Everyone who claims the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has been called to be ambassadors for Christ, being given the the ministry of reconciliation accomplished through the verbal expression of this reconciliation and the visual life that reflects this reconciliation. Oh, that the body of Christ, not only in Redlands, California, but to the ends of the earth, would truly live as though they are called. Listen to the words of Jesus in his prayer on Thursday evening of his arrest, and then three evenings later on the night of his resurrection. The first, as he prayed, John 17, 18, as you Father sent me into the world, so I send them. On the night of his resurrection, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. That's our calling. Os Guinness put it beautifully this way. Our calling means that our lives are so lived as a summons of Christ, that the expression of our personalities, the exercise of our spiritual gifts, the natural talents we are given direction to, and the power precisely because 
They are done not for our families, sounds a little strange, or our businesses, or even mankind, but for the Lord, and he will hold us accountable for them. Father, my prayer for me and for this congregation and for the body of Christ in Redlands, California, is that we would fully embrace your calling, that we would encourage each other in that calling, and that we would pursue intimacy with you that is the catalyst of compelling us to live as you have called us to live and serve in your name and in this place. Amen.